You guys want to find gold? I'm going to teach you the secrets of geology so you can find it. You have to ask yourself, why did this area produce so much gold? Because it sits on the outer margins of a collapsed caldera. A caldera is a large cauldron-like hollow that forms shortly after the emptying of a magma chamber in a volcano eruption. The collapse is triggered by the emptying of the magma chamber beneath the volcano, sometimes as a result of a large explosion or volcanic eruption. The flanks of the volcano see fissure systems crack and open up as well. If enough magma is ejected, the empty chamber is unable to support its own weight of the volcano effidus above it. Circular fracture or fault ring develops around the outer edge of the chamber. Ring fractures serve as feeders for fault intrusions, which are also known as ring dikes. And the reason why that they're perfect for creating epithermal deposits and porphyry deposits, they generate a lot of heat off of that magma chamber. As it begins to cool, steam comes off of it, mostly in the form of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and water vapor. This is especially true if it's a felsic magma chamber. Felsic is going to be responsible for the majority of your gold deposits. Felsic is going to be anything high in silicon, like rhyolite, dacite, and of course its intrusive counterpart is granite in the granitoid family. Now the caldera we're standing in right now is the Silver Creek caldera. It erupted 18 and a half million years ago and it was classified as a super volcano. It was so massive it ejected an ash plume with pumice and country rock as far away as Barstow and all the way into Kingman. And in fact you can still see some of this ash flow in the form of tuff outside of Kingman, Arizona on the interstate. It's called the Peach Spring Tuff. Thickest parts of the ash flow tuff was recorded at being 140 meters deep. In fact, if you look up on the ridge here, you can still see remnants of it right there. See that white band all the way across? That's part of the ash flow tuff that was ejected out of this super volcano. Here's a good example of the ash flow tuff that was ejected out of this caldera. Now keep in mind, after a massive explosion, all that material goes up in the air. A lot of it's going to come right back down. And that's exactly what this is. And this tuff extends all the way to Barstow and to Kingman. You've got Gold Road in the background and Oatman right on the other side of that ridge. We're on the very outer margins of that caldera. Here you can see the west side of the caldera has completely eroded away, leaving only the east side, which is west of Oatman. In this aerial view, we're looking northwest. You can see the moss mine in the background, which is on the outer margins of the collapsed caldera. This area is so rich with gold that they're still mining it today. I'm sure you've heard it. It's called the Moss Extension Mine. It's a large open pit heat bleach, and they're getting about a gram and a half per ton. The original Moss Mine was found in 1863 by Johnny Moss and was so rich that they pulled out $240,000 in gold out of a 10-foot hole. The mine is currently owned by Vertex Mining Corporation and is being developed by open pit mining using heat bleaching as a method of extraction of metals. After the blasting cycle is complete, the ore is removed and hauled to a series of crushers where it's brought down to a very fine size of a quarter inch mine. The ore is then transported on the huge leach pads where it's leached out using sodium cyanide. What the heck is this? Danger, blasting. the moss mine you can see a haul truck see him going up the hill that's all waste material in the back of that huge haul truck see that you've got quartz on the left quartz on the right and in the middle you have altered basalt that is really really tasty and that's why they dropped this shaft here and the quartz veins on both sides if you look at them at a jeweler's loop they've got small inclusions of pyrite in it so that's why they were chasing this of course manganese oxide which is in the mix we're on the back side of the moss mine somebody brought up all this gear you imagine somebody was hiking around up here found an outcropping and they wanted to drop a shaft to get down into it follow that vein down but look at this. Here's the original hoisting works right here. You see that? And look at the size of that monker. Best part of the hoisting drum. Wow. Can you imagine trying to get that thing up here? Yeah. And then put it together? Because it comes in pieces. You know that, right? The official rock test. All right, here we go. Pay attention. Ah. Oh, it's deep, but there's water down there. Look at that monker. Isn't that nice? Huh? That's what I'm talking about. This is brecciated quartz. See how the quartz has been fractured and then re-cemented. This can be very rich in your hydrothermal systems where the original vein structure has been crushed because of the different fault planes shifting. And then a new fluid assemblage has come up and re-cemented this again with a fine grain mass. And a lot of times all these different episodes crushing and re-cementing can have great gold values in there. And you 
you can see all the hematite in there. See that? And this is what a lot of prospectors look for, is this brecciated quartz with all this beautiful red fine grain mass cementing it all together. Look at this beautiful dike. The silicified dike. Oh, you see it? This is andesitic, it's got quartz in it. And you can see it's in this older chloritic andesite. So this is newer than this. And you can see where the chill margins here, where the, it actually cooled and baked the surrounding rock. Isn't that amazing? Wow. The old timers were smart and all they had to do was find a small lead, a small quartz vein on the surface or even a rhyolitic dike like I showed you in the background. And what they'll do is they'll start digging all these sample pits and shafts and cuts. And they're looking to see if that stuff gets any richer on the way down because a lot of times the quartz on the surface has been leached out over millions of years so a lot of the minerals that were in there have been leached out onto the ground or deeper down below so you're just going to have bowl quartz up on top that later weathers away to create float look at this right here see this this is what i'm talking about see this quartz vein you follow this you can still see some more of it right here Follow it, follow it. Ooh, look at this. See this outcropping? That's an outcropping quartz. Outcropping of quartz all along here. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Beautiful outcropping. See how bone white that is? That means there's nothing in it. But look at this. You see where an old timer came over here and he started digging right here, getting up underneath all this quartz. And this is his his high grade pile, there's nothing in it, but that's his high grade, his potential high grade. And if you follow this all the way down the ridge, all the way across to the other side of that hill, there's a series of mines that tap into this guy. Elephant tooth is a huge rhyolitic intrusion and it has created large feeder dikes that have come off of it. Feeder dike is a sheet of rock that is formed in a fracture in pre-existing rock body. Dikes can be either magmatic or sedimentary in origin. The magmatic dikes form when magma intrudes into a crack, then crystallizes as a sheet intrusion, either cutting across layers of rock through or underlaying masses of rock. Unlike dikes, veins form by minerals crystallizing out of water in a crack, often near the Earth's surface, and they often form near volcanoes or magmatic intrusions. Veins usually do not have chill margins like dikes do. Dikes can vary in texture and composition as they can range from diabase or basaltic to granitic to rhyolitic. Dikes often form as either radial or concentric swarms around plutonic intrusives, volcanic necks, or feeder vents in volcanic cones. This rhyolitic feeder dike has a northwest strike traveling several miles cutting through older chloritic andesite. Concentrations of hematite can be seen on this feeder dike which means potential for gold deposition. Prospectors have sampled all along this dike checking for gold values, but most of the gold here has been found in parallel veins that can be found on both sides of this rhyolitic feeder dike. Both the gold reed mine and the comet mine have dropped shafts into these near vertical, highly mineralized veins and retrieved a lot of gold. We have this rhyolitic dike running along the ridge here. And what they did is they came down on the side of it and this is the material they were mining. It's silicified, and I've got disseminated pyrite running all through it. And then, of course, I've got phenocryst in there as well. But it's not very rich, obviously. A way that you can tell if a mine was very productive is look for an ore bin. If they had an ore bin, that means they encountered a large body of ore worth stacking into an ore bin so it could be picked up and ran to a mill. The smaller mines, they usually hand stacked it on the side, which we call high grade piles, and then they pack it down with pack mules to the mill. But I'm not seeing anything here and this rock doesn't look that good. And you can see in the waste rock piles here where they, where they eventually ran into this, this basalt right here. So I'm gonna say they didn't find anything obviously. That looks like a drill rod, don't it? An old rusty drill rod. <clears throat> Look at that monk right there. <sighs> oh yeah. That's a drill rod, all right. Drill steel. Been sitting there for a long time. All right, let's see how deep this monker is. Oh, I guess that's it. <laughs> Maybe 40, 50 feet max. Still hurt if you fell into it though. More signs of hydrothermal activity running through here. You can see the clear, distinct zone in this rhyolite. And then of course you have this green chloritic andesite. And you can still see little grains of pyrite in the andesite as well. Oh look, there's a xenolith. I don't know if you can see it. Then you can see a xenolith right there. Do you see it? That's a xenolith. Just means a foreign rock in the melt. 
Look at that bug, isn't that beautiful? Almost looks like chalcedony. I might take that one and sample it, see if there's anything in it. Oh, uh, look at this exploratory shaft. I know it's plugged, but it probably goes down another 15, 20 feet. But I wanted to show you something, look at this. <sighs> I've got the country rock here. It was, this is a rhyolitic dike and it's brecciated in some areas. And then you can see an alteration zone over here. See this? Where it's been altered with hydrothermal fluid. What I want to show you is this little zone right in between here. Right there. Do you see that? This is what they were chasing. I know it looks like a lot of rock to remove just for this little tiny crushed vein. Well, this right here is referred to as fault gouge. And you can find a lot of gold in fault gouge. As this fault grinds back and forth like this, it grinds up all that material. There's that green chloritic andesite. See that quartz vein cutting right through it? Oh, isn't that beautiful? In these hydrothermal systems, you can see all the episodes by these lines. As the hydrothermal solutions are coming up to these tiny fissures, episode after episode, pieces of the wall rock break off and get encapsulated into the solution and then it solidifies. And this is a perfect example. You can see some of the host rock in some of this quartz. See that? Now keep in mind that you have more than one episode going on over millions of years, okay? This didn't happen overnight. And every time there's an earthquake or there's some type of magma intrusion, these fissures and faults are gonna act like little pathways for the fluid. So you have episode after episode after episode. As this is taking place, pieces of wall rock are gonna break off and get trapped inside the hydrothermal fluids. And when the fluids solidify because of a drop in temperature and pressure, well then guess what? They're encapsulated in there as well. Now the plaster deposits out here are obviously derived from the load deposit. Now I'm sitting on top of a small feeder dike, a basalt dike. And what's nice about these is if they cross any type of a potential gold bearing wash, and because it's such a hard material, it resists erosion. And it's perfect for capturing fine pieces of gold. So if you're gonna sample, this is what you're looking for. Look at this, I got water everywhere. This is incredible. That'd be great to pan in right there. That's why you need to bring one of these. This is from an area down there, so. All right, let's give it a shot. Ooh, this is nice. I could do this all day. That's the neat thing about being in this area. All right, let me get my spectacles on. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because if you start looking for these collapsed calderas and you overlay it with MRDS and then you overlay that with known mining areas and then a geological map, you're going to see a large pattern start to form. And that will tell you exactly where you need to prospect for potential load deposits. What you're looking for is any of the fault systems that are radiating out around the fracture rings of these collapsed calderas on the outer margins. And sometimes these fault systems are actually going to cut through it. Those fault systems are the ones that are gonna be the richest. We're currently sitting on the Mallory fault line, which extends all the way into Oatman, and it connects up with the Tom Reed mine. This is a hydrothermal deposition model. It has a 75 to 80 degree dip, and it trends to the Northwest. The values on this vein start off at a quarter ounce per ton on the surface, and at 55 feet, it reaches an ounce and a half. Now the quartz vein itself is hosted in green chloritic andesite. And it looks like this, it's got chloride in it, and that's important, we'll cover that later. Now on this vein, you're looking for any iron staining with black specks of manganese oxide running through it. Those are gonna be the areas that produce the most gold. Now when you're sampling load deposits, there's several ways you can do it. Once you've done your research and you know what you're looking for, you can go around the mine dumps and you can pull out grab samples or you can actually take chip samples off the vein itself. Or what you can do is get yourself a small hammer drill, battery powered, and you're gonna literally drill into areas that have high mineralization in them. And you're gonna collect that up and then pan that directly with jet dry. So if you're out here in the Oatman area, you should know this by now. You're gonna see lots of these guys, <laughs> lots of these guys out here because they're the descendants of the original burrows from the gold miners that were out here in the 1860s and up. Wow, how gorgeous is that? You wouldn't think we're out in the middle of the desert, but we are. 